Just I don't know, leaves, feathers, Thank you. He's supposed to be out there. This series of forums were organized by the Amistad Research Center at Tulane University in collaboration with the Shorefront Legacy Center, the South Asian American Visual Archive, Mkutu, and the Inland Empire Memories Project of the University of California, Riverside. The organization team consists of Cara Ulich, Christopher Harder, uh, Burgess Jules, Michelle Caswell, Tamar Doder, uh, Kim Wiley, Sam Samik Malik, and myself, Dino Robinson. This project was made possible in part by the uh, grant by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. As mentioned, diversifying the digital historic record is a series of four forums with the intent on reaching a broad audience in the field of archival and library services. The first forum was held at UCLA Riverside in October 2016 and focused on the topic definition Com uh, commonalities and divergences, what are the community, ar what are community archives. The second forum held at the Old U.S. Mill in New Orleans in January 2017 focused on the topic technology, benefits, and barriers for community archives for providing wider access to digital content. Today's forum, the third in the series, will focus on the topic collaboration and networks, benefits for community archives and libraries, archives, and museums. Today's schedule will include a keynote from Dr. Abdul al karman followed by a first round table discussion and breakout session. Lunch will be held in this room here. The afternoon will begin the second round table, followed by the second breakout session, and possibly a third consecutive breakout. We'll see how this thing goes. Afterwards, we'll convene in this room for breakout session report reviews. All participants and panelists are encouraged to participate in these breakout sessions. Parts of this forum is being live streamed. The breakout session will be audio recorded for future transcriptions. And the breakout rooms will both be in the parasol room here, uh, 4802, which is the room just halfway down this hall, and on the second floor in room 2403, which are all listed in the program book. So let's get started. Again, welcome. And uh, please welcome to the podium Christopher Harder, who will share the review of the January Forum held in New Orleans. Thank you, Dino. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and welcome. Good morning. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone who's joining us by the live stream as well. Uh, my name is Christopher Harder. I'm the Director of Library and Reference Services at the Amistad Research Center. Um, as someone who was born and raised in the Midwest, it's good to be back. Although I will say my allergies uh, are telling me you don't belong here anymore. So um, 
forgive me for that today. Um, I'd first like to thank uh, IMLS for sponsoring this project, uh, as well as our partners who have come together to um, uh, formulate this. Uh, one note of housekeeping, uh, Twitter, uh, we are uh, encouraging you to tweet out uh, today's events. The hashtag for today is hashtag DDHR3, since this is the third forum. Um, a recap of the second forum that was held in January down in New Orleans. As Dino said, the theme of this particular forum was technology, benefits and barriers for community archives for providing wider access to digital content. Uh, we were happy to have uh, an in-house audience, audience of about 50 with about 150 following on the live stream for that day. Uh, we had some robust discussions um, that went on. And as this project, uh, as the project sponsoring this series of forums is examining the idea of expanded diversity and representation within our shared digital cultural heritage, technology sits at the center of these discussions. For community archives with limited staff and volunteers, budgets and resources, questions pertaining to access to technological resources, staff training, maintenance of technology, etc., may not be and often are not minor considerations. Questions of interoperability, integration into technolo technologically rich digital initiatives, etc., may be even further down the line of consideration. So the topic and format of Forum 2 sought to bring together representatives from community archives, cultural heritage institutions, digital initiatives, and funding and support agencies to discuss the day-to-day -day needs and concerns of community archives with regard to technology. Uh, the format for that day was three roundtable discussions um, on the topics of current technology use amongst community archives, community archives and institutional collaborations, and funders' perspectives on supporting technology for community archives. Our Forum 2 participants included representatives from community archiving programs from across the U.S. South, including Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, so we had a wonderful representation. Uh, these included staff of the Community Archives Program at the Austin History Center, volunteers and staff at the Flat Rock Archives in Georgia, the River Road African American Museum in Louisiana, the Porch Band of Creek Indians in Alabama, and the Mississippi Delta Chinese Heritage Museum. Digital projects such as the Home of Language Project and the New Orleans Hip Hop and Bounce Archive attended, as did representatives from History the Digital Library Federation, Tulane University, CLEAR, and NEH. Throughout the day in these three uh, roundtable discussions, some common themes to most that spoke really to some of the issues facing um, Southern predominantly rural community archiving projects. But I think a lot of this discussion would pertain to a lot of community archiving projects outside of greater metropolitan areas. Um, those included, while some of the community archiving projects were engaging with technology to various degrees, most cited larger underlying issues that influence technological needs and capabilities. While many of the community archives are characterized by teamwork, shared values, and connection to their communities, better support, training, and IT infrastructure are needed. Capacity and sustaining projects um, uh, and support for not only initiating technological projects, but completing and sustaining those projects were voiced as major concerns uh, from the participants. Now, issues of capacity, infrastructure, and sustainability for digital projects within community archives may be mitigated by collaboration with cultural heritage institutions. Um, such collaborations, however, need to be carefully considered so that they are seen more as equal partnerships rather than hierarchical partnerships. While this may seem obvious, establishing clear goals and parameters of the partnership is fundamental for success and for avoiding conflicts. And cultural heritage institute, institutions must recognize that specific community archives may not represent the larger community, and that these communities may should not be viewed as being monolithic. 
In addition, collaborative projects must benefit the community archive partner and not just the larger institution. Um, representatives from CLEAR and NEH appreciate the opportunity to hear from the field and meet with the various representatives from community archives. And one of the interesting things that we touched upon is this notion of moving away from traditional uh, definitions of ownership towards more of a shared stewardship with our digital materials. Uh, funders see themselves as having a role to play in fostering greater diversity of cultural heritage with financial support, but at least for federal funders, the focus on project-based support rather than uh, general operating support is often based on accountability as tax supported agencies. And that question of support for project-based versus general operating support was voiced as a major concern of many of the community archive participants for that day. Um, CLEAR, uh, while a private uh, organization, is in many respects a regranting agency. So its financial support is often based on its own grants received to support its initiatives. Advice on strategies for building infrastructure within culture, uh, within community archives, including finding mentors, whether individuals or institutions, that have succeeded in building their own infrastructure or in grant funding. Creative partnerships, which has been a theme of a number of these um, forums that we've hosted. Um, and participation in grant writing workshops and research into funders, especially family foundations with a strong community focus. We hope to build on uh, some of these uh, concerns and questions that have developed out of the first two forums and continue that in the spirit today. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dino to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Thank you, Chris, for that. Um, today's speaker, Dr. Abdul Al Kalaman, PhD, University of Chicago, is Professor Emeritus of Excellential Studies and Library of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois. He was the originator of e Black Studies, the application of digital tools to the transformation of African American studies. His newest book is The Wall of Respect Public Art and Black Liberation in 1960 Chicago with Rebecca Zorin and William Crawford from the Plus University Press, scheduled for release in the fall of 2017. I believe you're on the real treat for uh, today. His topic is on memory and social transformation, the role of community archives in the information revolution. So please welcome to this podium, Dr. Alpine. First, I'd like to express my appreciation to Burgess and uh, Chris for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to represent uh, not only my work but the people that I've worked with because obviously everything is everything is really collective uh, and um, we have to always remember that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between the past and the present and the future. Uh, Title Memory and Social Transformation sort of suggests that. Uh, memory is the virtual reenactment of history. That's something that always goes on. In fact, uh, human society would not be possible without memory. Language, in fact, is the coding of memory. Uh, and uh, we name things, and that way we uh, affirm who we are because we are an extension of that history. And uh, social, uh, social transformation really is about uh, the continued progress uh, that we all face in trying to improve our lives. In fact, I'd like to uh, call the uh, slogan of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, AACM in Chicago, they think of themselves as ancient to the future. So the present is really very much a part of history, uh, both in terms of the present past as well as the present future, uh, that we are in the process. Uh, and I think that's a very important concept. We are ancient to the future, and that also implies responsibility. 
uh, because uh, we know that people will remember us or not, and uh, and that's very important. This works. Okay. Um, I also want to just mention my perspective because to talk about the reenactment of history from the standpoint of African Americans and certainly African American uh, working class people, uh, it's a memory of war, slavery, uh, pogroms. Uh, it's not a pleasant thing. Uh, and yet at the same time, the journey through all of that, uh, as uh, is often remembered, uh, is uh, where we gather strength in order to persevere and go on into the future. Uh, I come out of the 1960s. We thought we were having a revolution in the 1960s. We were going to straighten it all out. Uh, well, we changed some things. Uh, you know, we used to wear white socks and people had crew cuts and all the rest of it. That's gone. But we didn't have a revolution. The fact of the matter is, is I think it's important to say we're living in one right now. That is, there's a fundamental transformation of virtually every aspect of society. Uh, not everyone is participating in this revolutionary transformation in the same way as we know. There's a polarity. In Chicago, for example, a large section of the black community lives under virtual apartheid conditions. Uh, 43rd Street, for example. Just a few blocks away is Hyde Park, where people are living in a global a village, sit in a coffee shop and hear four or five different languages of people who are wearing very stylish clothes, et cetera, et cetera, having cappuccinos. Uh, so that when we think of memory, we have to ne negotiate all of those social environments and social contradictions. Just want to mention the fact that when we think about these uh, this concept of revolution, we have to think in a broad sort of historical sweep. Uh, many people think in terms of capitalism and socialism as a way to sort of periodize history. I'd like to suggest to you that both socialism and capitalism were really part of the industrial revolution. Both of those political systems were about industrializing their societies. And both of those systems have now been transformed by the information revolution. It's a very important point that the whole world is going through this through this process. This is a familiar picture. As we know, uh, smart technology, or what people call smart technology, is rapidly replacing or reorganizing employment and jobs. This is very important because this was the primary organizational principle of our society. That is, people going to work, where they live, where they work, etc. All that's being changed. This is very important when we talk about the concept of community. Community is where workers used to live, and now it's being transformed into a new system. And this is in part based on this famous reference to Moore's Law. That is, over 18 months, everything doubles both the capacity as well as the speed. Now, in addition, of course, that means we have to learn new language. Most people know gigabyte. That's a concept everybody knows. Well, just check it out. I mean, we have to learn new language. Terabyte, parabyte, exactabyte, zettabyte, yogabyte. These are terms that the uh, the digital companies are already working with. This very important point that uh, Google estimates that uh, more data is collected in two days than all of human history prior to 2003. So this is an exponential transformation uh, that uh, we have just begun to experience. And therefore, when people talk about the information society, the conversation is about big data and analytics, that is to say, the analysis of that data. So that increasingly decisions are shifting 
uh, from human decisions to these algorithms that process this giant collection of data. And so we end up with companies like Google or Amazon and so on, not only analyzing this giant collection of data, but using it to guide the decisions that we make. There's a very important book I want to reference that you should uh, take a look at. It's called Weapons of Math Destruction. It's a critical analysis of this use of analytics of big data. So that, for example, the evaluation of teachers is based on these algorithms and not the subjective human engagement with the multiplicity of variables. In other words, analytics are based on human beings selecting what variables are important and then using them to make decisions. Uh, and so this book, Weapons of Math Destruction, is very important. So we're dealing with the contradiction of people and technology. And what this means socially is we end up with what Castells, Manuel Castells, the sociologist, calls the dual city. This is the polarity. Part, partly is based on this notion of the digital divide, and partly is based on this notion of the uh, space of place, that is, people who are anchored in physical environment versus the space of flows, that is, people who are like most of you, and as I see on the L, most people sitting there with a device uh, are engaged in the digital world. And so we get this polarity of people who are the space of place, and if you're in a lower income, apartheid-like community, uh, you're in a place that is a desert, you know, there's very little institutional development that has survived. And that's because of what Fula calls root shock. In other words, communities are now experiencing the full implication of deindustrialization. And that means that the rug is being pulled out from under most institutions, including the church which is fundamental. And so most churches in these communities, obviously, are grandparents and kids. This is very important when we start talking about uh, community archives and community memory, because we get the despatialization of these communities. And therefore, memory is very important because often that's what's left of these communities. Uh, what happens is that buildings are torn down, vacant lots are created, and therefore, people have no spatial connection back to where they used to live, back to where they, they grew up, where there were transgenerational experiences. So our research question was really about the people in the community and their relationship with each other and how that can be the social basis for any digital representation that takes place. And therefore, the new paradigm uh, of the, in the information society for a participant, for a citizen, for an activist, is computer literacy. And therefore, the digital divide essentially excludes you from the society that's being created uh, as we speak. So this concept of grass rooting the space of flows that is, the space of flows, the use of digital tools, and grassrooting it means how they can be embraced in the basis uh, of the people in the communities that are most affected uh, by this polarity. So we have the space of place, the space of flows. Now I'd like to, uh, before going into some projects, uh, talk about three theoretical uh, concepts uh, that we've used in our work. The first has to do with the concept of cyber power. Digital memory 
is a representation in digital uh, terms that almost anybody can create about anything else that they have access to. But the important point about the community is whether the community is in fact empowered to represent itself. And when the community has access to these digital tools and can represent itself, we call that cyber power. This is very important. Uh, and therefore, when we look at the concept of cyber power, we have to not only at the bottom talk about access to digital tools. And here, what we're representing is a social access and not individual access. It's very important about this concept of digital divide. The concept of the digital divide in this country uh, was initiated in the Department of Commerce because they were interested in the consumption of digital commodities. It wasn't in the Department of Education, it wasn't in the Department of Labor, it was in the Department of Commerce. And what we're interested in is not the individual access, which has to do with income level and educational level. What we're talking about is the social aspect of communities, and therefore, uh, what we return to the institutions like the library, which now has become the essential institutional basis for a community overcoming the digital divide. And that crisis, of course, has to do with the struggle to redefine the library uh, in 21st century terms, and that's going on today, that struggle. And then we have the question of cyberspace. Of course, cyberspace is produced uh, by the corporations by the government, by the military. That's where this whole process has generated from. Uh, but what we're talking about here is the community developing that, and therefore, the historical community. And when, when we talk about the community, what we're talking about is a local, organic, transgenerational uh, organization of people. And so this model uh, is what we're trying to uh, used to analyze the current experience. But in addition to that, we've developed this concept of these three values uh, to talk about rethinking democracy and social justice in the society of the future. And so we're talking about first cyber democracy, getting everyone connected, literacy. Second, collective intelligence. That is to say, privileging all our voices and overcoming the essential stratification uh, that really has defined uh, institutionalized legitimate knowledge. If you think about libraries, libraries consume commodities that companies produce after people go through the, uh, the gatekeepers. And in the new society, we're going to have an opportunity uh, to have more voices, and that's, that's the whole point about collective intelligence. A very important scholar named Pierre Levy, L-E-V-Y, in Canada, has written extensively on this. This is a very important concept, uh, collective intelligence. And then information freedom, that ultimately we know that in the information society, there's really a crisis of capitalism because in the old society, Somebody would make a pair of shoes, and then they'd sell the shoes to you. You would have the shoes. I would have the money. I could buy another pair of shoes. I could make more shoes. But you would have those shoes. Well, in the information society, I create a digital product. I give it to you. I keep it. It's not even a copy. It's the same thing. And therefore, a new piece of software comes out, $495. In a short period of time, it's $129. In a short period of time, it's $29, and then the next year it comes packaged with whatever computer you buy. Why? Because we're giving it away to each other. It's impossible to, uh, to contain the, this whole question of uh, the way the commodity flow occurred during the industrial period. This is a fundamental question, so the rede redefinition of law, the, uh, the attempt to uh, co corral that. I mean, think about what happened with the music. Uh, industry, you know, I mean, people just that went wild. The cat, you know, the horse is out of the barn on that question. Okay. So these three values, and then finally, this question of 
of research methodology. As an academic, this is very important for us. Uh, and if you look at this, we have essentially taken what often is referred to as a scientific method and added two important aspects. I mean, definition is what's the problem that often involves in the literature. You have to identify what you're going to study. Data collection, then you go out and you gather information. But this question of digitization is very important because suddenly now we can operate collectively. People don't have to be in the same space. You can work together. Uh, and there's an element of preservation involved in that. And then discovery, what do you come up with? The design is very important, of course, today. Elementary schools are eliminating music and art precisely at the time when digital environments require music and art as a design factor in order to present uh, this information in a lively uh, and important way. Of course, dissemination, defining what audiences that you're talking to. But the last point, difference, is very important. It's the practical question of how in community studies, we can, in fact, arm the community with this information. Now, I just want to reference this volume. <coughs> We're in a university. <coughs> One of the interesting things that happens is people study the community and get the community to participate in these studies. And then that's the end of it. The community never finds out what the hell you came up with. There's no evaluation, there's no feedback loop from the community. And so one of the things we did was uh, went into the library of the uh, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana uh, to find all of the studies that historically have been done about the community and uh, wrote this up in summary form uh, and then began to distribute this volume back to the community. Because most communities have a love-hate relationship with institutions like universities uh, because they need them, because obviously they're sources of employment, they're sources of, uh, of uh, market. But at the same time, uh, it's hostile, uh, particularly toward lower-income African-American communities. Uh, so this is a very important aspect of what we call, and putting this online, we call this cyber resurrection. In other words, liberating information out of an institution and then making it back available uh, to the very community that provided uh, the information. Scholars often think that they discover stuff uh, and in fact people in the community actually have told them uh, what it is they supposedly discovered. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about our projects. The uh, first thing I want to say is that uh, what we've attempted to do is implement uh, these three theoretical points that I uh, have just uh, discussed. This one project, EVAC Illinois, uh, represented uh, a very important uh, methodological step uh, to, uh, in every instance when we start a project, uh, we survey what's online already and what's available because people are representing themselves. And one of the interesting things we found out is that uh, you know, we were attracted to very sophisticated digital packages. So Omega was one of the packages that uh, seemed to be powerful, et cetera. The problem is that given the digital divide, the reality is that it was very difficult to get the community just to fall in love with. And we discovered the community had instead fallen in love with Facebook. That's where the community was putting its information. And when I say that, I'm not talking about just small bits of information. There was one woman in Champaign-Urbana that put up 9,000 photographs about her family, about her church, about her community. So we're talking about trying to figure out how to uh, develop projects, but do it in a way that has the kind of uh, pathway that the community can embrace, so that academics and scholars and the people in the community can embrace. And what we discovered uh, was the wiki, something called the local wiki. Now, we all know what Wikipedia is. And uh, the local wiki was the, taking that software and configuring it 
so that it could be used to represent a community. But this is what happened. It started spreading. And a group of uh, young computer types at the uh, University of California, San Diego, and around developed this, and it was really great, and so on. And then the uh, foundation said, well, this is a great idea. Let's move it all to the cloud. And so they then gathered up all these independent, autonomous, community-based local wikis and stuck them up into their cloud. And so now they have corporatized the local wiki. And that helped us to understand that just as in the industrial period, freedom of the press belonged to people who owned the press. So likewise, in the information society, it may well be that the essential issue is who controls the server? Who controls the information? Which, of course, then points back to the local library. If the local library in the old system was essentially to warehouse and provide access to the commodities of these corporations called books, that maybe the flipping that script is that the library can host a server that could be the basis for the digital products created by the community. Because one of the essential problems in the community that's under economic and social distress is the sustainability of institutions that can host this kind of information. So we've got a real struggle here over what is the future going to be that enables communities that are under root shock to continue to maintain their memory. OK. That young man there is a high school student who was engaged in uh, one of our projects, which was to digitize high school yearbooks. It's very important. High school yearbooks represent one of the greatest genealogical sources. And, uh, you know, uh, it's like uh, people discover they're related to each other. Your cousin married my cousin, and I didn't know we were related. This is the kind of reality, particularly when you're talking about a, a community that has had transgenerational uh, residency uh, for families. Um, and so, uh, just to mention, I'm going to mention this later, but just to mention, what we're finding is that the crisis is the commodification of that kind of information called Ancestry.com. So that, for example, in, in Illinois, there are 108 counties. There is a county courthouse in every one of those counties that has been maintaining the records of those counties. And uh, what has happened is that Ancestry.com has gone and started digitizing all that information and corporatizing it, so we have to pay for it. Uh, so that we have the public resources being commodified and made available, which on the surface is what? Convenient, if you've got to go. But it's not convenient if you don't. And therefore, it's part of that polarization that's going on. And so that's very important that we understand uh, how, what, what the new environment is that we're facing. Okay. Uh, the first project I want to talk about is uh, the Murchison Center. Now, the Murchison Center was a, uh, a center that Bishop Murchison uh, founded in Toledo, Ohio. This was a community that was being devastated by the crisis of crack, the crisis of uh, unemployment. And so uh, Bishop Murchison thought that maybe using this new technology uh, that was emerging uh, would be one way to help youth. Well, they didn't have any computers. They had two Wang word processors. And uh, then they got a computer. And so, but they, too many people were there to, uh, to use the machines. And so they took pieces of cardboard and drew out a uh, keyboard. And they sat there practicing on the cardboard until they could get on the machine. 
Now, we at the University of Toledo uh, connected with uh, the Murchison Center and began to work with them. Now, what's interesting about uh, the Murchison Center is that these were people without the skills, without the orientation, but with the dream and the aspiration. And so the contradiction was how to the university to connect with this community center that was becoming a community technology center uh, and to essentially implement what we were thinking theoretically, how to create cyber power, how do we help the community represent itself, et cetera. What we discovered was that we had to build a social process. And the process involved the children that were coming there as sort of latchkey kids, um, the grandparents, and us. And grandparents are very important because uh, we discovered something about discipline. First, we turned into police. Stop doing that. You can't do that. You can't do that. But they kept doing it. They didn't respect anybody trying to tell them. But their grandparents came in, and they could just look at it, and they would stop. <laughs> but we discovered that once the kids understood and embraced the technology, discipline became something that was self-imposed. It reminded me, when I grew up and I was on the west side of Chicago, and the Boys Brotherhood of the Republic, BBR, 16 and Hammond. And we would police ourselves because people who had those brogan shoes on and those big taps, when they started walking across the gym floor, everybody would stop them because we only had one gym floor. And we wanted the ball to do what we wanted it to do, not what Jimmy's shoes made it do. In other words, discipline was self-imposed. So that's a very important concept when you're creating an institution in a local community where the norms have been disrupted and the youth have to discover themselves and recreating themselves in a process. What we did was, first we created a written record of the Murchison Center. The first stage was handwritten minutes. The next stage was the government reports when they got uh, grants, there were actual proposals, actual formal paper. So we gathered that together and created a 40 volume history. And I think it's probably the only 40 volume history of the Community Technology Center in the United States. But a detailed record of exactly what happened in the acquisition of skills, of machines, of people, etc. So it's a very important uh, point about documenting the history of every one of your projects, uh, because we are, after all, at the baby steps of the information revolution, and what's happening in the community, in community archives, represent the possibility of democracy and social justice in the future. That's really what's at stake here, not simply the details about the particularity of your experience, which obviously is important as well. But when we take the collective experience at the community level, we're really talking about something very profound about uh, society. Now, the big project is what we call E Black CU, E Black Champagne Rebound. This is a, a very large site. maybe 200,000 pages of material, uh, maybe 150 hours of video and audio files. Uh, and you can see the uh, access by uh, decade, and you can see some of the uh, collections. A lot of this is cyber resurrection uh, because we had so many memory institutions that had pieces of information that essentially were being accessed by almost nobody. And so the digital aggregation of this information suddenly made a vital uh, resource. 
And one of the important ways in which this resource is being used is not only the people who grew up and stayed in Champaign-Urbana, but all those people whose families were there but now live all over the world. And therefore, this memory, this reenactment of history, has been very important in a way that far exceeds the local community, but connects with the families that are now dispersed. One of the interesting points about this project that might interest you is that we actually developed a manual uh, that describes the methods that we used and how they can be uh, replicated. And one of our graduate students, uh, actually, we got a grant from the Illinois Humanities Council and actually traveled uh, to eight cities in Illinois uh, talking to librarians, particularly, about how this can be used in the local community because what we're struggling with here is to get the library not only to be a place where people can go to download information, and often people think that's literacy, being able to download information. And we're arguing that's not the, we want to flip that script. And literacy is being able to upload information and make it something that is accessible uh, to the audience, that is to say, your community. Now, one of the important aspects of how digital memory can become community archive, and I say that not just in a physical sense, but in a subjective sense, that the community is engaged with the material. This is an important distinction. You can have representation of a community that's digital, but it's not embraced by the community. So one of the things we did was, we said, well, let's figure out a way to get the community to overcome this love-hate relationship with the University of Illinois and embrace the project. And so what we did, we said, well, there are a lot of people in the community that are difference makers. And so we had a project of identifying difference makers and brought them to campus and honored them and uh, this is a picture of a people. Uh, and we had a volume, and every one of them was, had a bio, a picture, etc. And these are the people who represented all the churches, all the social and fraternal organizations, the businesses, uh, the leadership. And so uh, in, 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 in honoring them, and in telling them that they were the ones to guide us in doing the community work was a step toward legitimating the role the university can play. Not as a leadership, not as uh, the reservoir of information about the community for itself, but embracing the community and having that relationship. Uh, because the university is a resource that can't be ignored, but it has to be transformed in order to be of any real utility for the local community. And in that process, we developed a manifesto. We dedicate ourselves to become difference makers. As information revolution is underway, leading global transformation in health, education, business, culture, and in the diverse activities of our daily lives. And it goes on, mentions the three values and this is something that uh, we have distributed and people sign and commit themselves uh, as difference makers for their community in the context of this information revolution. But you know, this whole point about memory and social transformation is not just a question about community. It's also a question about movement and struggle. And so part of the whole question of community archives is the struggle that takes place in the community and in movements that connect to that community to transform. And so I want to just talk about a couple of them. We all remember the struggle that took place in Ferguson, Missouri, um, when a young man was killed and there were great protests that took place. One of the interesting things that happened 
is that librarians at the uh, at Washington University decided that this was a very important opportunity um, to target the present. And remember the concept: we are ancient to the future. To capture this moment uh, of uh, a community protest uh, to preserve the memory. And so they quickly fanned out and started gathering up all the leaflets, uh, getting all kinds of pictures and video, etc. It's very important. Um, of course, then they got funded and the uh, project changed a little bit. Uh, connected was the local library because the schools were not in session. But the local library took a position to remain open. And what's interesting is that they were also trying to raise the funds. And they thought that they might uh, raise three or four thousand dollars. Nationally, there was a response. They got something like within a couple of weeks, they got fifty thousand dollars. And they themselves connected with the university project in order to make this, uh, to preserve this information. But I want to say something about this question of uh, the polarity that takes place. Since that protest took place, three of the activists, local activists, have been murdered in Ferguson. The first two were found uh, shot in the head in cars that had been burned up. So the preservation of information about a struggle can also be a part of the process of the continuing struggle that the community has to face. And so this is something that would relate, for example, to uh, struggles around toxic environments, you know, the environmental crisis that we face. Because what? We're up against large interests that represent uh, a struggle against any kind of social justice for communities facing uh, toxic disaster. So it's important to, to understand that community archives for depressed communities is part of the struggle. That's the point I'm trying to make. And that you, as community archivists, are an active part of the struggle for democracy and social justice in this society. And that, of course, relates to SNCC in the Civil Rights Movement. Every community that was involved in the struggle, Albany, Danville, all kinds of places in the South, are now being represented in the SNCC Legacy Project. A um, very important project, and you all recognize Fannie Lou Hamer. This is our site on Malcolm X. Uh, again, many communities are connected to this. Tremendous amount of research still has to be done uh, on the communities that were impacted by Malcolm and the Black Power uh, struggle. So I want to say in conclusion that what I've tried to say is that community archives face a great challenge at the beginning of the information society. As I said before, uh, I thought we were having a revolution, and we didn't. And I got a little bit depressed and, you know, spent my time thinking about going and cooking and you know, other things. But now I'm born again revolutionary in the information revolution and social duty. Questions if anybody in the audience have questions. I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment or but I'm an archivist and the whole history around archives, um, it's all you know, based on the French Revolution and free and open access to information. And it occurs to me there's a little bit of ancient and present to to that because it was all the, if the government's creating records about citizens citizens should have access to those records and they should be available. 
Um, and so we're, we're kind of like starting over and tapping into something old at the same time and all this. But the other thing is on um, the ancestry issue, the digitization of government records, taxpayers have paid for those records to be created. Those are, those should not, there should be no pay law in to access those records. And that's very concerning to me because taxpayer funds have already been used. They, those, those are our, it's, you know, it's fundamental to democracy to, to open and free access to government records is how we maintain our freedoms. So we're always struggling, I guess, is what it occurs to me. And this is another place of struggle is if ancestry is charging for records that are government records, so it's thought provoking, all yes. of that. Yeah, the most recent example is environmental data. As soon as the new uh, presidential administration took office, the environmental scientists started immediately uh, trying to archive all of the research that has not been taken down from EPA's website and so on. Uh, so there's a struggle over the memory of scientific research regarding climate change. And uh, so I think it's important, but see, this is a this predates the digital. Why do we know more about American history than John Wayne? Uh, why is it we don't know about the real slave rebellions that took place, Bacon's rebellion? You know, the unity of black people and white people fighting against the elites and rulers. In other words, history becomes a tool for the management of the consciousness of society. And, and that, that is, you know, <clears throat> uh, that's serious business. Yeah. And, you know. Well, and also, I mean, I don't mean to, but um, I, I watched the um, Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks a couple nights ago, the new HBO. And unfortunately, I haven't read the book. I've got to read the book now. But um, the use, you know, the, the book that you show and the, the use of communities for research purposes. And then that research is not shared, but kept hidden. That may be in the same way as it was with her story, but the use of people for, you know, that, that whole, of, that's another aspect of this, is that, um, you know, that should be, that should, should be open and public. So I love the idea that you took, went back and resurrected all that information. Mm -hmm. but Kind of funny you mentioned that because um, the city's health department director is not pointing people towards the Rebecca Sleep site anymore because she feels that with the Opal project that is overly corporatizing the story. So she's pointing people towards the Wikipedia page instead. And it's also interesting, um, the Winnipeg Library used to have a fantastic genealogy collection that had all of the county and family records for the Eastern Seaboard. Um, and it give away some of it to the new library, library, which of course is not that accessible to the public, uh, with the justification that, oh, it's all on Ancestry. And some of us said, well, it's not all on Ancestry. It's not all on Ancestry for free. And shouldn't it be the, public, the role of public libraries to preserve access to that in an easily accessible public space? Well, the other thing is public libraries are being defunded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but it's interesting because some small county small places, people are volunteering. And the other new development is what's, what are called the little libraries, the little free libraries. These little boxes that are being placed in people's front yards, and et cetera, that books are there, you know, leave one, take one. And that's happening. So there, there are these little bubbles of, of, of democracy and people trying to reassert values and an orientation uh, that's very important. but. The next step, of course, is organizing in order to fight for the policy to protect public libraries. I mean, that is, and what's happening in, in our school, for example, we were called the Graduate School of Library and Information Science. We're now called the uh, School of Information Science. And that's the big data takeover. And so the public library is being devalued. 
in that context. Well, but sometimes from people working in public libraries and library administration. Well, yeah. I mean, it's sort of like part of the problem with black people is black people. I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, you know, in other words, the crab fairy, you know, the, you don't have to put a top on it because they control themselves. They even let it crab out. About surveillance and access to um, documentation of social protest movements, and whether or not um, providing sort of unlimited open access to these community archives of social protest is, in fact, or in some cases, opening up communities to further surveillance, and what we as a community archivist should be doing in response to that. This is a this is really an important problem. Uh, start with the question of writing a book. Who reads a book? But we know the surveillance agencies are definitely going to read the book. Uh, we used to have a, uh, a publishing operation. And uh, you know, there's this place in Virginia uh, and DC that would always be you know, buying what we produced. So OK, surveillance is constant. Forget privacy. That's over. You know. Uh, but this question is, first, is a question of aggregating public information. Uh, today, I'm passing a leaflet out, there's all kinds of leaflets. Next week, anybody got one? So this question of memory for the movement itself, uh, it seems to me, at one level, outweighs the danger. On the other hand, uh, we know about face recognition software. So if somebody is walking around in a demonstration scanning every face without a clear political objective of representing the social dynamic of the protest, then you're providing information that, you know, kind of big data, that is useless for the community in its aggregate, although in the individual want to see themselves, maybe, you know. But in the aggregate, you're providing information for surveillance. This is, this is a tension. This is a, this is a problem. And it's a rush to get people to become digitally literate and become digitally active so all the things that we're doing will be part of their search for cyber power, as opposed to inadvertently good intentions, the road to hell is paved with, giving it over to the surveillance agency. So it's a very important point that we should always be thinking about. Any other questions or points? Quick question about copyright. Okay. Um, collecting leaflets, as in Ferguson, is there tools to copyright to that? And also, when you're putting things like older papers online, and it's one thing Laurie and I have discussed in terms of digitizing local existing papers is it's sometimes difficult Well, in terms of leaflets, etc., we practice copyleft. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a, it, they're in the public, and, and, and but we're not turning them into commodities. And see, that's the issue. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're not selling them to somebody. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I have a real problem with this question of copyright with regard to cultural heritage. See, we know there is something about real estate, if the government wants to take your real estate for, in quotes, the public good, they can. Exactly. But we don't have that same legal principle when it comes to cultural heritage. So take Malcolm's archive. A daughter takes the archive and puts it in a a uh, storage facility in Florida. The bill doesn't get paid. So they sell in auction the material. Now, you saw my, my mountain page. So my sister is looking through eBay and all these places that we collect mountain dolls and watches and, you know, and discover there was a auction. She emails me. I have a listserv, I put it out, the American Library Association picks it up, 
The next morning, it's on the front page of the New York Times. All hell breaks loose. The auction is stopped. Eventually, people raise money, and now all that material is at the Schoenberg in New York. But imagine that could have been lost. Now, the question is, is that uh, something that's so important that the family could be paid for it? So they did a payday. There's something involved. They have a proprietary interest in that. But at the same time, there is this bigger interest that we as a country have in our social heritage. I mean, for example, somebody could have a you know, very famous woman, her husband, after she dies, her husband goes into the nut stage and burns it up. How do we protect and preserve the cultural heritage of the country? Well, it seems to me we need some kind of legal principle, like eminent domain, for cultural heritage. Something to think about. But then, that means you have to trust this government to do something that is not in favor. Well, which government you trust in here? Yeah, I mean, everything's in process, you know. <laughs> um, of course, we all trust uh, to a certain extent because life is impossible without that. I had my car fixed last week. I was driving 70 miles down the road. I trusted somebody. Um, but that doesn't mean you don't have to pay attention. And right now, we're engaged in a struggle regarding libraries. That goes to the Library of Congress. That goes to FOIA. That goes to a lot of things. These are struggles. And that's why, for example, in your professional life as an archivist or a community uh, uh, person uh, that's engaged in community archives. You have to see yourself engaged in the struggle. And, and if we don't see ourselves in the struggle, then we don't, for example, network. We don't, for example, go to conferences and pass resolutions. You know, we don't pay attention to our so-called political representatives. Uh, and I don't believe that just because people send in uh, phone calls or sending petitions, etc., that that changes things. But if it doesn't change things, then what's the next step? And the next step? Because right now, as far as I'm concerned, a million people ought to be marching around the White House today. You know. Like I said, I'm a born again revolutionary, so. <laughs> hey, well, thank you very much. space. Even the computer labs were available to the community. And, uh, you know, to without walls, a feudal situation where, you know, it's protected space. Uh, that's part of the struggle that has to take place. Um, but uh, let me start by saying what I'm talking about in terms of social, if you take an institution like a church, 
we have found that when you create a community technology center in a church, people think of it as something for the children, not something to transform the institution. So that uh, this uh, program is being streamed. Every church service can be streamed. It doesn't take a lot of technology. But suddenly now you could communicate so those families that have left and live in another space could still participate in that church. So that means that instead of the individuals, it's the institution that gets transformed. Now part of that is the ministry. And ministers often, when we're training people, they don't sit down in front of a computer, they walk around because they don't want to be exposed in terms of their, their you know, exalted position and yet their need for the ABCs of it. Um, we call that adult basic computer. Um, but your point about uh, the social, the relationship between different institutions, this is a common problem. For example, in Boston, every institution, every university has an agreement with each other for access except Harvard. So that's an example of an institution being outside of a access in terms of higher education. And I think that that's a really important point that should be taken up, first and foremost, in discussions among the librarians themselves. Because it's a question of, if money is a scarce resource, then institutions in the same location have to figure out what their respective roles can be in order to maintain a collective level of excellence that in the past was an aspiration for a single institution. Yale at one point had to say, we now believe in selective excellence. We can't be at the top on everything. And so I think that's the first step, is that, that, that question of how do we network and how do we sit down at a policy level and talk about this. But that's to be compared with the community, so that this whole concept of community engagement requires a community to place expectations on institutions. Because if we're going to allow you to take up information about us, or we're going to deposit our information, then we want to make sure it is accessible to more than just you. And so that has to be something uh, that is important. And so you have to gather up the difference makers to make a difference. In this instance. And so, uh, but the last thing I would say is that as the movements develop, like for example, when the women marched and everybody around women's issues marched and 200,000 people in Chicago, the question is how do we take every battle front and aggregate them so that we have a movement that addresses every battle front? That's really the question of how you fight for democracy, is that it's a question of, of uh, each one of these battle fronts. We, we use the example of, uh, to try to beat back this idea that any battle is more important than another battle, of the uh, dentist office. Everybody sitting in a dentist office holding their jaw. Somebody rushes in and says, my tooth really hurts. Can I go next? Well, you know what I mean? response you're going to get is sit down and wait your turn because I can't feel your pain. I feel my pain. And I'm next. You know. And so what we're talking about here is everybody acknowledging each other's pain. Everybody acknowledging that we all have different problems. And the only solution is when we aggregate ourselves and fight for that higher level of democracy and social justice, which can be then something we can all buy into. And so the question of information freedom, one of those values, is something that we have to fight for, whether it's the commodification through uh, Ancestry.com, whether it's through institutional uh, siloing itself away from everybody else. All of these are impediments to information freedom. And that is, of course, essential for the kind of society that we want to live in. Okay.
That was wonderful, wasn't it? Yes. You know, the oh, yes. We can change things. Um, we're technically on schedule still, but let's take a quick 10 minute break um, and then we'll get with the uh, first um, panel session.